Hi, we're going to spend a little bit of time over the next few minutes and talk about groups and group process. And what makes a group? What can we do in a group? How are groups beneficial? And what purpose do they serve in mental health? What makes a group? People with a common goal, people who work together, people who get together socially, people who have continuous regular contact, and people who live together, people who go to school together. So you guys all go to school together, you have a common goal, and sometimes you get together socially to work on projects. So you are definitely a group. There's four different types of groups. So there's a primary group where people have face-to-face -face contact. This can be a small, more intimate group, or it might be a larger group. It could be like a bridge club or a book club. It could be a PTA meeting where people are seeing each other. A secondary group is usually larger, has less ties. It's much more impersonal. I like to think of like a church, some AA functions. Uh, other times where you might get together, maybe a bereavement group could even be considered a secondary group. A formal group is structured and it has appointed authority, very much like a classroom. You guys meet every week, you see each other, and it's very structured, and your teacher is your appointed authority. An informal group is like a friendship group or a hobby group. It's people who get together socially. Maybe you belong to a dinner group or you are involved in something where you see each other and you ride bikes together or you go to the gym together, or you're in spinning class together. That could be a very informal type of a group. So in a group structure, there's different levels of power or leadership styles. And in some groups, there's an autocratic leader and that person makes all the decisions. They tell you how it's gonna be. They control the group, they direct the group and they have the final say. There's also a democratic group, and this is where it encourages the group to speak to each other, to verbalize their opinions. Everybody has a say, everybody's opinion is important, and we take everyone into consideration when the final decisions are made. That doesn't mean that there isn't a leader in a democratic group who's gonna make those final decisions, but they try to take everyone into account. Then there's a laissez-faire group where the group members operate as they choose. There used to be this kind of discipline back in the 60s where it was just laissez-faire. People did whatever they wanted and nobody really directed things. In some ways, you could look at a group like Google who's gone back to that. They say, oh, well, we let everyone do their own thing. But they have very high expectations. They have very high goals for people. So it isn't really a laissez-faire group. In a laissez-faire group, people just do their own thing and they operate as they so choose. There's also different classifications of power. There's something called referent power. And in referent power, it's the power that we give to another person. We look at this person, we hold them in high esteem, and we want them to be our leader or the leader of the group. So we give them referent power. There's also expert power. Expert power comes from somebody who's knowledgeable. Maybe it's that nurse who's worked on the unit for 20 years. They have expert power. They know everything about the unit. They know how it functions. They know how it works. Your teachers have expert power. They've been teachers for a long time. They have advanced education. They have expert power. There's also legitimate power. The dean has legitimate power. The president of the college has legitimate power. The president of the United States has legitimate power. Those power, people have been voted into office and they have been given power. There's also reward power. If you do so much sales, then you'll get a bigger bonus. You'll get more commission. If you work an extra shift, you'll get time and a half. If you do something additional, you'll get additional pay or recognition. That's reward power. Coercive power is like the negative side of that. We'll, if you don't do something, then you'll get in trouble. So if you call in sick too many times, then you'll get fired. That's coercive power. Let's talk about groups and how they're formed. There's four different phases that go into a group forming. And it's interesting, I like to think of it as the semesters that you're in school. 
So first there's forming and during forming members of the group come together and they are dependent on the leader. And if you remember in first semester, it felt like your teachers were more like mom and dad and they were kind of herding you around and helping you to feel comfortable. You look at your buddies in your classroom and you, you find things that are similar. You want to be the same. You want to be connected to each other. So you focus on the sameness, on the similarities while you are forming your first group. By second semester, you start looking at your ways you're different. What are your disparate values? What are your personal needs? And here in second semester, this is where conflict can emerge. And this is where we are storming and we are saying our independence and making ourselves as something separate. Then third semester comes around and you start norming. You've identified yourself as an individual and now you're able to look and seek to get to be friends with other people and find ways of functioning that are better and that make the situation better. By the last semester of this program, you're performing. You're able to focus on a task. You're able to work on things. You accomplish them. You find the good in other people. You find the areas where you all have something in common and you work towards completing that goal. You are now performing the task or the goal at hand. So what is group therapy? Well, let me just start by saying it is not torture. People seem to think that group therapy is something bad. A lot of times the patients don't want to go to group therapy. Oh, we don't want to talk about our feelings. We don't want to be in there. But group therapy does some really great things to help you to feel better about yourself, to recognize that other people have the same problems you do, and to come up with better solutions for those problems. So some reasons that group therapy works. Well, you can get new information. Other people give you a different perspective. They talk about their problems. You begin to realize you're not the only person that has problems and that other people have the same problems that you do. It can inspire hope. You can hear how someone overcame maybe the same thing you had or something worse than what you had. It gives you a chance to interact with others, and that's good. It's socialization. It forces you to think about something other than yourself, and it forces you to look at others and what could be their possible problems. It helps you foster acceptance and belonging. It makes you part of a group, and it makes you feel like you are something, and you belong to something bigger than yourself. And this is an important feeling for most of us. You have an awareness that others have problems. There's something about when we have a problem, we look at ourselves and we get so self-absorbed and caught up in our own stuff that we forget that yes, other people have feelings and problems and a life and things are happening to them as well. It can help you gain insight into your own problems and it gives you a chance to give of yourself to someone else and to think about someone other than yourself during the time that you're in group therapy. So what are some elements that are important? Well, the perfect number for a group is 10 to 13 people. If you have less than 10 people, it's really difficult to get interaction going. And if you have more than 13 people, you'll notice that your group gets unwieldy and too many people are talking at once and you can't keep things under control. It's most helpful to have a trained therapist and running a group takes a lot of talent. I've been in a lot of groups with people and some of the most highly educated people were the worst group therapists. But you need somebody who can help that interaction and help people talk to each other and talk about what's really important and not just talk about things that are on the surface. You have to have somebody who's comfortable um, talking about problems and you have to have that happen in a group therapy. It's where you're gonna talk about things that are happening in your life that are difficult. One thing that's interesting is when people are in a group, they often recreate problems in the group. So if you pick fights at home and that's causing a problem for you, you're probably going to pick fights in the group. And you're going to recreate that same situation for yourself while you're in the group. But it does have to be a safe place where you can share your feelings and other people aren't going to make fun of you or put you down or make you feel bad about yourself. And it also provides a feedback loop, which is an opportunity to fe for people to tell you you're acting a certain way. You're bringing this on yourself. 
you're repeating the same issue over and over. You're not really looking for a solution. You're just trying to have us all talk to you about your problems. So it's a good feedback loop for other people to give you feedback. There's a two different types of groups. There's an open group, which means that it runs indefinitely and is ongoing. Certain open groups, you saw that when you went to AA, some of these groups, people come and go, they come when they need to, they come, uh, they leave, they come back. That can be the same way in a bereavement group, uh, other types of support groups. A closed group is structured and it includes the same members and it goes for a set amount of time. You might be dealing with a specific issue if you're in a closed group. Some AA meetings are closed groups where it's just certain people who come to those meetings, they're working on issues, and they don't want people coming and going during the meeting. So who shouldn't be in a group? If you're working in an inpatient psychiatric unit, you don't want an antisocial personality disordered person there. That person's already all about them, they don't care about anybody else, and all they're going to do is be disruptive to your group. You don't want a paranoid client in there because they already think you're talking about them and lo and behold you might be talking about them. They're just not good in a group. You also don't want a borderline client in your group. This person will be disruptive, they will cause problems, and they will just make things difficult for everyone else. So you don't want them in your group as well. There's different types of group. There's family groups, there's work groups, there's committees problem solving or therapy groups, creative groups where you make things, you do things. There's social groups where you might get together and eat. But the purpose of a group, it varies depending on who's established a group. So a psychotherapeutic group is where members learn about their behaviors, they look at their own issues, they look at who they are, they look at how they can resolve those issues. An education group provides information for that person. We're seeing more and more education groups that have to do with disease processes. So you might have a COPD education group, or you might have a education group that's gonna talk about a chronic illness, or Crohn's disease, or any one of these things where people need to know a lot about their disease process. You have a support group. That's where members share a common problem. We see that with AA. That's definitely a support group. It's also a self-help group where members share their common experiences. You can have a support group if you're trying to quit smoking. You can have a support group if you're trying to quit gambling. You can have a self-help group for those things as well. Family therapy is a little different. Family therapy focuses on the family dynamics. And the difficult thing about this is you have to even after therapy, you have to go back and live with your family, the people that you were just in therapy with working on your issues. It makes it very unique that people live together and then they're working in a therapy situation. Usually there's an identified patient, but most often the identified patient is simply acting out the problems that are going on in the family. Uh, they seek to understand or change family dynamics. It's very difficult to change long-term habit patterns like that, but it's used for assessment and treatment and sometimes can be very successful in helping families to communicate better or to look at their issues and help them to overcome some challenges that they have. One thing that's really important in a group is that you can set limits, that you can keep the participants on track. You can keep one participant from talking or overwhelming the group and monopolizing things, making people feel like they don't have a say. And you have to also be the person who can let the participants know what the expectations are for the group. What are the ground rules? How are we gonna stay with those ground rules? And what is it important for us to get out of this group? You may have to set limits during the group and ask someone to leave. It's very appropriate to say you have to do X behavior. You can't let somebody start yelling, hitting, acting out, or being inappropriate in a group. And as a group leader, it's important for you to set those limits and make clear what is the expectations while the person is in the group. So we already talked about this. State the behavioral limit, identify the consequences, and identify the des desired behavior. So you may have to say, 
it's not appropriate for you to be yelling in the group. What I'd like you to do is be able to state your feelings the way that you feel right now without yelling and then let us talk to you about why you feel this way. So group ground rules, having feelings and acting are two different issues. Everything that happens in a group is confidential. What people say in the group stays in the group. It's your responsibility to talk in group. You can't be forced to talk in group. It's what makes the difference for someone. You can sit there and get nothing out of it, or you can choose to be a participant and grow and change based on what you learn. And also don't socialize with the people in your group outside of the group. It just makes things weird and you're tempted to talk about what you talked about in group and then it just escalates from there. And what happens in the group is confidential and private and shouldn't be put out to the rest of the group. All right, so enough on group therapy. Let's spend a minute and talk about complementary alternative therapies. Why are we talking about these in our class? Well, we're one of the few schools that actually has a section on complementary alternative therapies, but they've gotten much more popular. People are using them as much as they visit a primary care physician. So it's important for us to be aware of what these complementary alternative therapies are. The Office of Alternative Medicine was created in 1991. In 1992, more people visited an alternative health practitioner than visited their family doctor. And that's when people really started to take notice. These used to be considered, oh, that's just Eastern medicine, or that's just somebody's funny idea. But now complementary alternative medicine has become quite mainstream. Even some schools of medicine teach courses in alternative medicine, and many nurse practitioner programs emphasize the use of alternative medicine as an adjunct therapy to go along with allopathic medicine. So what's the difference between allopathic and homeopathic? Well, in allopathic medicine, the health beliefs and practices are derived from a scientific model. It usually involves technology or other interventions of modern medicine. We see a lot of prescription of medications. We see surgical intervention. We see physicians um, prescribing different things. In homeopathic medicine, health practices are derived from traditional cultural knowledge to maintain health status or increase health. We'll talk a little bit more about those. So allopathic medicine, medications, immunization, surgery, hospitalization, IV fluid, invasive procedures such as heart cath, dialysis, blood transfusion, and the like. Allopathic medication is excellent. It does so many things for people. We know that it does much to heal people and it can be used in conjunction with complementary alternative medicines to provide optimum health. So what is homeopathic medicine? Well, it's acupuncture, herbal medicines, chiropractic medicine, which is now considered much more mainstream, nutrition, yoga, pet therapy, therapeutic touch, relaxation therapy, guided imagery, to just name a few. What is our role as a nurse? Well, many times patients will tell us things, and so we need to ask good questions. Certain uh, over-the-counter homeopathic medications, such as St. John's Wort, Kava Kava, Ginkgo Biloba, these medications interact with other medications that you might be taking that would be allopathic medications. So we need to ask questions. A lot of people, when you ask, what medications do you take? They don't consider that they need to tell you about any natural medications that they're taking, even though that natural medication might interact with another medication. We also need to listen. We need to listen between the lines. Ask ourselves, what is it that the patient is really telling us? and then educate. It's up to us as nurses to let people know about the medications, about the different therapies that they might be using. We have to do it in a non-judgmental way. Some people are very in tune with these different uh, homeopathic medications. They're very invested in their vitamins and things that they take. And we want to be very respectful as we ask questions and we listen and we educate them. I want to mention multidisciplinary teams. We're seeing more and more of this uh, in the future. We're doing it more now where people work together. Everybody has a part to play in providing care. So occupational therapy, I always want you to think about ADLs. 
They help people get dressed. They have all kinds of cool toys, help you put your shoes on, um, to close your zipper, to do all different things. It's task-oriented activities that promote independent living skills. Recreational therapy helps to restore, remediate, or rehabilitate in order to improve functioning and independence. And art therapy allows for diverse experiences that you can be communicated in different ways. So in art therapy, you might have mask therapy or someone might be painting or they might be creating something, which is an expression of whatever feelings they have and can be very therapeutic. A few other alternative therapies that you might consider, meditation, prayer, guided imagery, biofeedback, art, humor, acupuncture, exercise, my personal favorite, animals, another one of my personal favorites, pet therapy, psychotherapy, hypnosis, oriental medicine, chiropractic medicine, herbology, aromatherapy, yoga, tai chi. These are all alternative therapies. And I just wanted to mention that in China, if you're diagnosed with arthritis, your doctor prescribes Tai Chi. Go to the park and do Tai Chi. So we might consider some of those things here in our country as we look at people and we look at the obesity rate and some of these uh, chronic illnesses that really can't be cured by allopathic medication. And we teach people how to handle them in a more successful manner. A few herbal medicines that you should know, ginseng, which does energy enhancement. It's also considered an antioxidant. Ephedra, which has been taken off the market. People were using it as a diet aid and it killed a few people because they overused it. St. John's wort, which is for depression and anxiety. It's been around for years. We can trace it back many, many hundreds of years. Echinacea is an immune boost booster. People take it so they don't get as many colds. Valerian is a mild sedative. You also see kava kava used to help people sleep. It's an anxiolytic. And ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, is for memory and circulation.